Hi, I'm Pammy, sorry, Pamela, and you're watching Made In. Middle Eastern food is a cuisine built on tradition, history and passion. And many of the ingredients and techniques used today are identical to those used in ancient Egypt. Today's show is all about food. Three courses and three meal times. Have you just had your breakfast? Lunch, brunch, supper or dinner? Well, stay tuned as we discover how we eat has evolved over time, depending on our class, demographic and environment. Now let's hear from people who eat. How many meals a day do you eat? Five, six. Five or six, wow. Okay. Little meals, often. I eat two meals a day. No, just lunch and dinner. No, no I don't have time. <laughs> I'm normally finished by two, so it's a bit early. What's food? Yeah, yeah I think he has four. It's more like five smaller ones. Three. Two is enough. I don't eat food. Um, most of the time it's three. Six. I'm training for the marathon. I eat almost five. Uh, oh. Yeah, three, three. Wow. Probably more. Probably more. But I try to eat every three hours. Well, as you know, there are many claims to the origins of the three course meal. Three meal a day type concept. So I shall take you through a culinary journey, but be warned, food images will be prevalent. We shall start in 9th century Cordoba, where an all singing man called Ali ibn Nafi, known by his nickname of Blackbird, came from Iraq to Cordoba and brought with him the concept of the three course meal. Soup, followed by fish or meat, then fruit and nuts. This innovative way of eating apparently spread to other social classes and communities and eventually throughout Western Europe. Blackbird was born in Mesopotamia, probably near Baghdad, in about 789 AD. Details of his early years are very sketchy. He was most likely a freed slave or the son of slaves. Some Arab historians say he was of African ancestry. Others claim he was Persian or Kurdish. Now, Blackbird was part of the royal court of the Arab Empire in Spain. He taught the palace cooks how to prepare Spain's delectable ingredients. Meats, fish and fowl, vegetables, cheeses, soups, nuts and fruits in imaginative recipes inspired by Baghdad's haute cuisine. He delighted courtly diners by elevating a humble spring weed called the asparagus into a succulent dinner vegetable. Now, one of his popular dishes, meatballs and small triangular pieces of dough fried in coriander oil, came to be called Blackbird's Fried Dish. Another, a roast of seasoned broad beans, survived into modern times as a Cordoba classic. Blackbird arranged for palace diners to be served in courses one after another, beginning with soup, continuing with meat, entrees, alternating with fowl dishes and ending with sweet desserts. Now this orderly presentation style, unheard of even in Baghdad, steadily gained popularity, spreading through the upper and merchant classes and even the peasantry. In time, the custom became the rule throughout Europe. Now let's hear from the experts. Hey, my name is Shana Ali. I'm actually a nutritionist, a naturopathic nutritionist and an exotic food specialist. So specialising in Middle Eastern food and cookery and in Indian food and cookery. I've been involved with food for, since a young age and I've grown up with Indian food, Bangladeshi food, but also developed a keen interest in Middle Eastern food in particular. I think there's a big overlap in terms of spices used and also some of the ingredients. But I really love looking at and delving into the history behind some of the dishes and there's so much so much history and, and also so, much, so many interesting facts behind how they were prepared and also how they were created um, and originated from where they came from. And I think um, my real interest is looking at how the cuisine is changing over time. And uh, yeah, it's it, both in Middle Eastern food and in Indian cookery, so it's something that's really ever evolving. Basically, Middle Eastern food can be stated as covering a whole wide region from um, parts of Europe up until parts of Asia and it can be really uh, uh, defined by its past. Each region has its own individual 
um, recipes and also tastes and each of those is defined by what was traded in the past in that area and also what was available in the market and the seasons and I think really you can't define Middle Eastern food just by calling it Middle Eastern food you have to really break it down into different regions because some recipes may seem common to in the whole of that genre of Middle Eastern food but they have different variations depending upon the regions. One of the most basic actual um, uh, recipe or um, dish that I can think of really is the, is the pita bread or the flat bread and that is a very very basic uh, example but it varies between regions or different countries so much and there's so many different ingredients that are added to it or different ways of preparing it that the actual end flavour is very very different compared to another country. And in fact, pita bread is the oldest known bread in the world, so it's the most ancient bread around. Prior to the three course meal, what was really in fashion at the time was to a show of uh, ostentation and to really show your wealth in terms of what can be offered at meal times. And um, what really came about was um, a person called Ibn Al Nafi, who was who had a nickname called Ziria, which means blackbird in Arabic. He was a Persian composer and really a polymath, almost a, a Leonardo da Vinci of his time in that, in that region. So this was in the medieval um, Islamic period, so the 9th century. And he originated from Persia, but he was very popular in the, in the courts of Cordoba in southern Spain, in the Umayyad courts, and also in the Abbasid courts of uh, Baghdad in, in Iraq. And he really was an arbiter of taste and fashion at the time. So he really brought about changes in the way people wore their clothes, but mainly in the way they ate their meals. So he invented the three course meal, which consisted of soup, main course or entree, and a dessert. And he also brought about um, new vegetables and fruits into style in the region as well. I think um, what's really going to be prevalent in future is how to incorporate um, food as part of your um, way of preventing disease and also trying to cure or fix what's already happened to you in terms of um, health afflictions. And I would say that more and more people are going to become more, uh, much more aware about how food is affecting them and they will start selecting their meals and breaking down their meals into um, choosing ingredients as well as uh, cooking methods to really drive what they want to achieve, where they want more energy, they would have much more protein based meals, you know, they would actually start breaking that down into smaller meals as well during the day, but little and often once again, mainly protein based. And, um, you know, it wouldn't be driven as much by um, heavier meals during the early part of the day, it'd be much more in the middle part of the day, and then very, very, very light or nothing at all in the evening. I would say mainly it's about health, but it is a little to do with money because it seems that the more, the more um, nutrient-rich foods are more expensive nowadays because there's been more awareness, so it has driven prices up, the demand for it has gone up, so obviously it's going to be more expensive. And um, you know there are alternatives to that. You can actually, instead of going for a superfood such as a blueberry, you can go for a different berry, such as blackberry, which is much more easier to obtain and um, it's much more cheaper and again it's not classed as a superfood but it is nutrient rich. I think people are going to move towards more of those alternatives now. In the Middle East you have so many well-known foods that really defines the region, the whole um, area in particular such as um, hummus. It's prevalent throughout the Middle East, every single country almost in that, in that region has that. Um, falafel as well, um, tahini which is a big big base and foundation for many Middle Eastern cuisines and also used on its own, on, on bread. Um, and also you have the most popular um, consumed vegetable in the Middle East region which is aubergine and that's used in baba ganoush as well, hugely popular. Um, you've got uh, in Europe chips but you've got hummus in the Middle East which is prevalent everywhere. I'm a chef at a cookery school in London. Um, we, um, people come here to learn how to cook, so um, we, uh, um, we cover all sorts of different cuisines, we do a lot of baking classes, um, and we introduce people to different flavours from around the world, um, just in sort of nice, short, um, sort of easy to manage um, little classes, just to get people sort of excited about, uh, about cooking, about different, different cuisines. Um, I used to deliver pizzas and then I started um, putting the toppings on pizzas. I um, quite enjoyed putting the toppings on, so I just, um, I, um, I decided I wanted to learn how to cook. So I literally just got some cookbooks um, at home, started, um, started learning, um, learning to bake bread, um, then got a job, um, a job in a small pub, and then another pub and a restaurant, um, and just kept um, looking for different, 
you know, I'd, I'd worked somewhere long enough um, uh, until I'd learnt everything or um, wanted to move on and just ex explored some different cuisines while I was sort of, um, while I was learning. I love making bread. We have different class lengths um, and yeah, we do sort of a one or two hour um, Moroccan class. We've got one coming up today, as it happens. Um, and um, we'll cook a nice, simple tagine, but we just talk uh, we just talk about how important it is to slow cook and get the, get the nice, get the best flavours out of things. So, it's sort of basic, basic cooking techniques that we teach anyway. I love the simplicity of um, sort of, of of real cooking, and I love it wherever I go in the world. But what I'm seeing in India at the moment um, is a lot of shopping malls, or the sort of the American, the big American companies, KFC, and everyone else coming into India and that becoming more mainstream. And it seems to me like every culture maybe is, or a lot of cultures are going to go through this. We've gone through this sort of stage of getting more and more unhealthy um, and then people are actually stopping and, and wanting to learn to cook again. And in the last 15 years that I've been cooking, I'm really noticing uh, a big change in the way people are thinking about food. Um, it's partly from, um, from a health thing, it's partly from uh, a lot of um, cooking programs on television. Um, I mean, cooking has become really mainstream, we, and that's and that's why and that's why we have places like here, like Atelier de Chef now, which I guess 15 years ago, I'm not sure would have been a, a, um, a, a successful business in this country because it's just um, people then weren't so interested in cooking. You know, when I used to tell people I was a cook, it was quite um, it was it was quite alien to a lot of people. I was quite sort of surprised that all oh, someone can cook because um, we've lost a lot of that tradition. Um, uh, in families, I think. But it's going around the other way, and people are starting to want to learn to cook, to buy natural ingredients, and just to cook really simply. Um, so that's happening here. I'm guessing that cycle will be gone through in other places as well. Um, and, um, and slowly, I think, just getting back to just um, eating how we should eat again, with a bit of respect for the environment, um, and respect for our own bodies, um, and um, just wanting to just have some just nice flavours and natural food. We get people here of all sorts. We get people um, who are really interested in cooking anyway. We're in the city of London. Um, people work very hard here during the days. Um, um, people want to, but people want to go home and, and and actually are starting to get sort of enjoyment for, and, and relaxation from cooking at home. So people come here um, with uh, actually we get a lot of people with some quite good cooking skills, but just want to develop themselves. Um, there are some skills that they actually want to be shown by a chef rather than just read out of a book. Do you ever eat three course meals? Three course meals sometimes, especially traveling like now. Do you have a preference? Definitely, definitely like the, uh, some sort of vegetable for a starter. Probably prawns for starter and like a phyllo pastry. Mostly one pizza. Lots of healthy, you know, vegetables. For the main course, I usually like to have like something with meat. I go to the Indian, definitely the Indian. The one burger. And then a main course, something with beef. Uh, mains would be a full rack of ribs. Fresh fruit when available. Too much for me, a three course meal. Feeling hungry? Well, how do you fancy 12 courses in one go? Go on, tuck in. Yeah, a 12-course meal doesn't sound as appetising when it's stuffed into a single tin can. The man behind this all-in-one creation is designer Chris Godfrey, who said he wanted to give the working man or woman the chance to dine like royalty without the washing up. So, want to know the full list of ingredients? Well, I hope you can write really fast. Here we go. So, it contains a selection of local cheeses, sourdough bread, pickled beef, ricotta ravioli, shiitake mushroom topped with filled peppers, halibut poached and truffle butter in a coconut crepe, really? Risotto forage rams, French onion soup, roast pork belly, pear ginger juice, ribeye steak with grilled mustard greens, cracked pie and French cannelli. Yeah, we kind of got full after the ravioli. <laughs> Now, many of us across the world have been brought up on the idea of three meals a day as a normal eating pattern, but it wasn't always that way. Do you miss breakfast and think, hmm, I can catch up at brunch or lunch, dinner, maybe supper? So confusing. <laughs> Let's find out why. Food historians generally agree course meals were made possible by the agricultural revolution approximately 10,000 BC. 
when humans evolved from hunter-gatherers into organised agricultural communities, civilization happened. And apparently, one of the earliest examples we have of meals offered in different courses comes from ancient Rome. And classic French courses, obviously, consisting of 168 meals. Now bear with me. The first course, eight potted meats and vegetables and 16 hot hors d'oeuvres. Second course, eight important intermediate dishes called broths, 16 entrees of fine meats. Third course, eight roast dishes and 16 vegetable dishes cooked in meat stock. Fourth course, eight plates of cold meat and fish dishes and 16 raw salads with oil, cream and butter. Fifth and last course, 24 different kinds of pastries, 24 jars of raw fruit, 24 dishes of sweetmeats, preserves, dried in syrup and jams. Phew. Appetizers, hors d'oeuvres, starters, antipasto, gustus, tapas, mazza and meze, zakusi, dim sum, smorgasbord. Small bites served before meals to whet the appetite, play integral roles in many cultures and cuisines. The most familiar versions are Middle Eastern meze and their Spanish derivatives tapas. Appetizers, called mazza in Arabic, constitute one of the glories of this ancient cuisine. They serve as a foretaste of the delights to come in the meal and are served on small dishes in what can amount to an incredible number, depending on the formality and importance of the meal. The impressive variety of these appetizers range from the simply presented olives or cheese to more complex preparations, such as eggplant puree and hummus. The serving of these tidbits of food is believed to have been carried by the Arabs to the Iberian Peninsula during the 900 years the Arabs were in that part of Europe. Phew, after all that eating, I wonder when the gym was first invented. Here are some interesting facts on the three most important meals of the day. Breakfast. The Romans believed it was healthier to eat only one meal a day. They were obsessed with digestion and eating more than one meal was considered a form of gluttony. This thinking impacted on the way people ate for a very long time. At the turn of the 20th century, breakfast was revolutionized once again by American John Harvey Kellogg. Now he accidentally left some boiled maize out and it went stale. He passed it through some rollers and baked it, creating the world's first cornflake and obviously sparking a multi-billion pound industry. Brunch. In 1895, Guy Beringer wrote a column for Hunter's Weekly, arguing the case for inventing a whole new meal for late Sunday mornings, mainly for Saturday night partygoers. No, not the luxurious kebabs many of us are more accustomed to. The following year, he was mentioned in an issue of Punch, which announced, to be fashionable nowadays, we must brunch. Now for some, lunch is dinner and vice versa. But it's the Earl of Sandwich's famous late night snack from the 1750s that has come to dominate the modern lunchtime menu. One evening, he ordered his valet to bring him some cold meats between some bread. He could eat the snack with just one hand and wouldn't get grease on anything. Whether he was wrapped up in an all night card game or working at his desk, it wasn't clear. But both have been suggested that whatever he was doing, the sandwich was born. Now today, the average time taken to eat lunch, usually in front of the computer, is roughly 15 minutes, according to researchers at the University of Westminster. Last but not least, dinner. Was the one meal the Romans did eat, even if it was at a different time of day. Now food for thought, Richard II's 1387 dinner. Here we go, are you ready? The ingredients included 14 salted oxtons, 84 pounds salted venison, 12 boars including heads, 120 sheep heads, 400 rabbits, 50 swans, 150 castrated roosters, 1,200 pigeons, 210 geese, 11,000 eggs, 12 gallons of cream. <sighs> but by the early 19th century, for most people, evening dinner had been pushed into the evenings, obviously, after work, when they returned home for a full meal. But the death knell for the family dinner supposedly sounded in 1986, ding, when the first microwave meal came onto the market. 
Well, whatever the claims of yesteryear, we can be content in knowing that food and how we eat it will constantly shape the way we live our lives. Now, thanks for watching. If you believe something has been unfairly claimed, then get your comments in or just add your frustration to our Facebook page. But now you are free. You're free to do something thoroughly worthwhile with your time and start eating. Ta-ra! I don't eat food.